thanks for coming to this talk and uh, thanks for the organizers for uh, the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm going to tell you today about how I'm using scientific Python to study evolutionary biology. So I'm Yoav Ram. I'm, uh, I just finished my PhD in uh, theoretical evolutionary biology at Tel Aviv University. I've been using uh, Python since 2002 and I've been using scientific Python and teaching uh, Python uh, for undergrads and graduate students since 2011. And recently I started doing a Python training uh, for engineers and uh, scientists, data scientists in, uh, in industry. To tell you a bit about theoretical evolution, I'm under the assumption that most people uh, aren't very familiar with this uh, uh, field. Uh, formally, it's called population genetics. That's because uh, this field is concerned with the genetics of entire populations not just uh, uh, individuals, but entire population. The main focus is on studying uh, changes in frequencies of gene variants. What am I thinking about here? I'm thinking about things like uh, the uh, color of the eyes, right? So you have gene variant for green eyes, for blue eyes, for brown eyes, or uh, blood types, right? You have A, B, AB, O, stuff like that. And these are traits that are affect our uh, livelihood but they are uh, genetically encoded and they are transferred uh, from parents to offspring. Uh, the main forces of evolution that we consider are uh, natural selection, random genetic drift, and um, other forces that we're not going to focus here, like gene flow, recombination, mutation. And we're using this framework to study and understand, better understand and even predict uh, adaptation and other biological phenomena, such as speciation, Etc. So uh, a quick primer on uh, evolution, or at least how uh, a theoretical evolutionary biologist thinks about evolution. So uh, evolu evolution uh, has these three basic, uh, evolution by natural selection has these three basic uh, properties. You have some traits in which you have variation. So we have these uh, brown and green beetles. So there's variation in the color trait. This uh, variation leads to differential reproduction, which means that it affects uh, survivability or reproductive success. In this case, uh, the green beetles get, are, uh, get eaten more by the birds because it can see them on the tree trunk. And importantly, there is a heredity of the variation. So green beetles will have green offspring and brown beetles will have brown offspring or are at least more likely to have uh, brown offspring. So uh, natural selection acts uh, in this kind of a sch schematic uh, uh, illustration. You have green and brown beetles. The birds eat green beetles. So when it's time for uh, the reproductive season, you have more brown beetles than green beetles. Because the uh, trait is uh, genetically transferred, it's uh, inherited, in the next generation, you'll have more brown beetles than green beetles. This cycle goes again and again and again until the brown beetles have uh, taken over the population. That, that was natural selection. We also have a different force called random genetic drift. In random genetic drift, a beetle can be uh, miss out on reproduction or not survive, not because of its uh, color, but just because of random effects, just random stuff happening. So this shoe didn't step on the beetle because it was green or brown. It just stepped on it by accident, without any uh, regard to the color. To formalize these uh, ideas and uh, implement them using uh, mathematics and uh, computational uh, science and uh, do some uh, in, in using code, the most standard model uh, to study the change in frequency of gene variants is the right fisher model. It's uh, called uh, after uh, Sewell Wright and uh, Ronald Fisher. Fisher is the same famous Fisher who invented the uh, p-values and the uh, Fisher exact text and uh, test and stuff like that. So he, he invented this stuff for st to study population genetics. So he's both the father of population genetics and of uh, modern statistics. So the Wright Fisher model, uh, I'm going to give you like the simplest version of the Wright Fisher model, but it can be uh, easily uh, extended or uh, it's uh, scalable. Um, so you have two gene variants, zero and one, right? Like the uh, brown and green beetles. Um, we follow the number of individuals with each variant. 
So N0 is number of individuals with variant 0, and N1, number of individuals with variant 1. The total population size is constant in this model. It's kind of a caveat of the model. Uh, so it's capital N. And uh, we, also follow the f we have also the frequencies of each variance. It's P0 and P1. OK, so the first step is uh, how do we model uh, natural selection using in this model. Um, so we assume that variant 1 is favored by selection, meaning that uh, its frequency in the next generation is likely to be higher due to natural selection. And in this case, the frequency in the next generation, P1, is equal to this equation, where uh, 1 plus S signifies the advantage of variant 1 over variant 0. Uh, zero. Okay, so S is called the selection coefficient, and it uh, quantifies the advantage, the evolutionary advantage due to natural selection of variant 1 over variant 0. It's always uh, relative to uh, one variant over the next, over the other one. Random genetic drift, we're going to uh, model it using random sampling. So the idea is that uh, from each generation to the next, we do a random sampling of the uh, individuals, of which gene each individual will have. So I sample a random individual, and I check which gene it will have, which gene variant it will have, based on the expected frequency that we calculated in the previous step. So this is, in effect, uh, drawing from a binomial distribution with a, a number of trials, capital N, and the success for, uh, and the probability for success, P1. OK, so that was how we, the model works. And now what are we uh, focusing on? What, do, what are we interested in? What is the question? So assuming that we have a single copy of variant 1, what is the probability that variant 1 will go to fixation, will take over the population? Uh, rather than go to extinction, right? So there's just one copy. It can go to extinction because of that stepping effect, right? Somebody might step on it by accident. Uh, but if it uh, sur kind of survives random genetic drift, it will go to fixation because it has an evolutionary advantage. So we're interested in this fixation probability. We're going to use NumPy, which has been uh, talked about uh, today by uh, several people. Uh, the fundamental package for scientific computation with Python. It has n-dimensional arrays, uh, array functions, and uh, lots of other stuff. And most importantly for uh, this, uh, this uh, model is that it has random number generators. First step, I have to uh, import from NumPy uh, uh, the binomial uh, random number generator. I initialize my uh, population. Right? I'm going to simulate an evolutionary process. So I start with the population, which has a single individual with the genetic variant 1. Um, that's what we said. We assume a single copy. And the simulation continues as long as I still have, uh, I didn't reach either fixation or extinction. Okay? So N1 is bigger than 0. It didn't go extinct. And it's lower than uh, capital N because it didn't take over the population. Okay, so the first step is uh, calculate the frequency of variant 1 after the effect of natural selection. I just translate the equation into uh, this expression. The next step is drawing from the binomial distribution. So again, I just translate this equation into this uh, expression. So uh, this is something that's very nice with uh, working with scientific Python, that uh, mathematical expressions and Python expressions tend to look very similar, which is very uh, nice when you're trying to uh, find what you did wrong and trying to translate the math to Python, etc. Finally, when the, uh, the while loop uh, finished, n1 is either 0 or capital N, and uh, uh, we hold in, in the variable fixation, we hold a Boolean that says, did we have a fixation? Did N1 reach capital N? So you can note that uh, in NumPy was useful here because it allowed us to use random number generators. If we were to do this using uh, pure Python, uh, we would do something like this. We'd use the uh, random number generator from the standard library. We would uh, uh, draw capital N random numbers, and then we would sum how many of these random numbers were lower than P1. That's effectively 
drawing a number from a binomial distribution. If you look at the comparison between the NumPy version and the pure Python version, you can see that for a small population of roughly of a thousand individuals, we get a 42 uh, fold uh, uh, increase in performance using NumPy. And for big populations, a median, we get uh, uh, even a bigger in increase in performance. So you see that uh, NumPy is much better for doing this kind of stuff because the, uh, the idea is that the loop, uh, drawing uh, n random numbers, we basically lost the loop by doing it inside NumPy. OK, so can we do this even faster? Yeah, we can use Cython. So Cython uh, is an optimizing compiler for uh, Python that uh, plays very well with NumPy. And it does lots of stuff, but uh, uh, basically the idea is that you write NumPy code using some more semantics. Uh, Cython converts that into C code, compiles it, and then wraps it with a, a Python wrapper, which allows you to use that uh, compiled C code directly from Python. Like I said, it can do lots of stuff. We're going to focus just on declaring types for variables. So I'm going to wrap the uh, simulation code from before uh, with a, a function. I call it simulation. And it gets the number of individuals and the s, the selection coefficient. And I, uh, and I add these type declarations, which are the uh, Cython uh, type declarations, both here and inside the simulation. And that's all I do. OK, I just add the type declaration, nothing more. Very uh, straightforward. It was, it's much harder to install uh, Cython than actually uh, use it, So uh, at least on the Windows machine. When I uh, do the, now the comparison between Cython and NumPy, you see that I get roughly two-fold increase in uh, uh, performance because Python doesn't do as much type checking. OK, that's great. Um, but to actually approximate the fixation probability, I need to run lots of simulations. Just running one simulation doesn't tell me anything about what really happens. I need 1,000 simulations. The kind of naive, pure Python approach would be, would be to use a for loop, right? Just run the simulation 1,000 times, collect all the fixations. You'll have a list of uh, Boolean numbers. And then you can sum fixations. Booleans act like uh, integers and uh, divide by the len, and you get uh, the uh, frequency of uh, fixations in simulations. OK, that takes eight seconds to run. That's a lot. I don't want to do it eight seconds. That's time that I need to sit there and look and wait. And if, uh, if there is a bug, then I need to debug it. And it's like a big development loop. I, I want to make this faster. What, what I, I can, can do is, again, use NumPy. Now my simulation function will follow not one population, but thousands of simulations concurrently. So the number of populations, the number of concurrent simulations I'm going to do, I call it repetitions. I initialize n1 to be an array of ones. So uh, for each population, how many individuals with variant 1 do I have? I started all with ones. The uh, selection uh, operator looks just the same, because uh, uh, NumPy knows how to do uh, array arithmetics. So I don't need to change anything. It does everything element-wise. Um, the random number uh, drawing looks also very similar, because uh, NumPy allows me, I give it a, uh, an array of P1. P1 is array, because the result from here was an array. It uh, allows me to draw numbers from multiple binomial distributions at once. And I keep this array of Booleans that uh, tells me for each population, did it reach fixation or extinction, or do I have to keep updating this population? So this is uh, my uh, update uh, array. I initialize it to true, because I want to uh, start by uh, updating all the populations. I keep going as long as uh, update.any, so as long as any population has to uh, be updated. And I use it to only draw the exact number of uh, random numbers that I need because that's the uh, most expensive operation in this simulation. Uh, finally, I return an array of Booleans, which tells me for each population, did it reach fixation? Uh, using this approach, I can get, even with a small population, I can get a very uh, large increase uh, in uh, speed. And basically, something that took me eight seconds now takes me uh, 25 milliseconds. So it finishes. Uh, like slightly after I, uh, I run it, it finishes. Of course, I want to uh, uh, now to st actually study evolution. So I want to study how does population size affect fixation probability. 
can imagine that in a small population, there is a, a good chance that I get hit by a random genetic drift, but in a large population, what happens? Well, I don't know, I want to just run these uh, simulations for different population sizes and then get uh, intuition from that. I'm going to use uh, a log space, which gives me uh, an array of numbers. Uh, here I, I get numbers from 10 to, to a million with uh, uh, 20 numbers overall. And they're spaced so that in log space, the, uh, the differences will be equal. And uh, this time I do run a loop over all n values. I could go further and put this back into the, uh, uh, lose this loop again, put it into the uh, uh, simulation code that I had before, and uh, have n1 and p1 be a two-dimensional array instead of one. But I uh, kept this uh, simple for, for this case. So now I get a, a 2D array of uh, booleans. Uh, each row is for a different n value, and each column is a different repetition, different population. I want to now average over columns so that I get for each n value uh, the uh, fraction of populations that reach fixation. So I use, uh, use a fixations.min, that's a NumPy aggregation function. It aggregates the, uh, the 2D array. I tell it x is equals 1, it will aggregate over columns. I also use it to calculate the standard deviation. And I want the standard error of the mean, so I have to divide the standard deviation by the square root of no the number of simulations. So now that I have the mean and the uh, standard deviation of the mean, I can plot that using matplotlib. That's the uh, standard plotting uh, library uh, in uh, Python. So I uh, plot the fixation probability as a function of the population size. And the, the markers are the results of the simulations. So the markers are the uh, mean that we just calculated, and the, uh, the height of the error bars are the SEM, the standard error of the mean that we calculated. So you see that as the f uh, population, when for a very small population, uh, uh, say 10 individuals, the uh, fixation probability is roughly 10%. Each of the variants has the same uh, probability to fixate. Each of the individuals has the same probability to be uh, kind of the, the parent of the entire population in the long term. But as the population size increases, uh, the fixation probability uh, uh, goes to twice S. Um, the, line in this, the, uh, the line in this figure is an approximation. And how did I reach this approximation? So uh, Motu Kimura published this approximation for the effect of fixation probability from a, a population size. I have this uh, equation. I won't get into the details how it was uh, developed. And uh, I can implement it very easily with NumPy. N uh, what's nice is that because here I only use NumPy operators, so the function Kimura is a, a, what's called a u-func. It's, uh, it works on arrays out of the box. I don't have to do anything to make it work on arrays. So you can see that if I use it inside a for loop, or if I use it directly on the array, I get a much better performance in operating it directly on the array. And I didn't have to do anything to do it. Uh, so it's very, uh, anything special, so it's very nice. Um, NumExper is a, is a relatively new Python uh, uh, package that does fast evaluation of uh, a math on arrays. And uh, you can see here how I use it. I just use the same expression. I give it inside a string to numexpert.evaluate, and I get a five-fold increase in uh, uh, performance. So I don't, I'm not going into details here. If you're, uh, uh, if you're using this kind of stuff, then you should check out NumExpert. So this is the final plot that I got. Uh, if you want to dig deeper, um, you can go to this GitHub repo, uh, yoavram slash pycon il 2016. There's a Jupyter notebook there. You can uh, download the notebook, or you can open it with a binder. There's a, a small uh, banner there that says open in binder. And that means it opens online in the cloud, and you don't have to install Jupyter or NumPy or anything. And you can play with everything that I showed. Plus, you can uh, uh, see uh, uh, another simulation that follows the fixation time. So how much time does it take the population, uh, the, var the, sorry, the variant one to fixate in the population? And also a, a more complex simulation that uh, follows uh, multiple types, not just two, 
which means that uh, it uses a matrix multiplication and a, a, a multinomial random number generator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all on the uh, on the notebook, and there are some examples of using pandas and Seaborn. Seaborn is a, a very cool visualization uh, package. Uh, Numba is a, like a, uh, people said today already, is a JIT compiler. You can see an example of using that. IPy Parallel is a very uh, easy to use a parallelization uh, engine for Python. Uh, and IPy widget is a, a cool way to do interactive HTML widgets inside the notebook. Like I said, the presentation, the notebook, and other stuff are available at uh, this uh, uh, GitHub repository. And uh, thanks for uh, listening. <laughs>